Hello and welcome to Gundry's Guides, episode 3. This series is all about British wildlife, so very logically this, this episode will be about dead tropical beetles. Specifically, six remarkable species I've been lucky enough to acquire. These are very much at the large end of the order, with the saber-toothed longhorn and the Hercules beetle among the very longest. In terms of heft, however, the Titan and Goliath beetles are heavier and can reach 50 grams in the adult form and at least twice that in the larva. The beetles make up 40% of all insect species and therefore 20%, 25% of all animal species on Earth. Haldane was absolutely right when he described the creator, whoever, whoever he or she might be, as inordinately fond of beetles. Beetles can be as small as the 2mm long drugstore beetles that are themselves inordinately fond of eating other beetles. These are a major museum pest and I seem to spend a lot of my life worrying about them in my own collection. Adult beetles are characterised as having tough wing cases in place of the forewing, so they can have a very robust lifestyle, as well as being capable of agile powered flight. Firstly, we have the harlequin beetle, a large and beautiful species found from Mexico to northern Argentina. Apart from its large size and beautiful markings, it's famous for the very long forelegs of the female and the absolutely ridiculously long forelegs of the male. These are used for fighting with rival males so as to monopolise high quality egg laying sites. A male will guard a site day and night but the species seem to mostly fly at night and the females seem to therefore mostly arrive at night. They seem to be able to find fallen trees from the smell of the large amounts of sap that are extruded. It's fun to think of how many trees they must bounce off when flying in the dark but the robustness of the beetle body form likely, likely keeps them safe. Having said that, the male's mandibles are used to try and bite off sections of rivals' legs and antennae, so life is far from a picnic for an ambitious male. Many pseudoscorpions hitch lifts under the wing cases of harlequin beetles, and pseudoscorpion populations can be isolated from other populations until the next generation of adult harlequin beetles emerge. Up to 15 pseudoscorpions have been found hitching on a single beetle, but the total in this case was less than 2.5% of the beetle's weight, so probably not a major problem. This is not regarded as a form of parasitism. Next, and in no particular order, is the Imperious Sawyer. I was hoping that the word Sawyer would mean something grand, maybe an earl or a knight, or someone who's paid to slaughter people in cold blood by a medieval king, something like that. Sadly, when I looked it up, it means a person who saws wood for a living. How disappointing, but not an unreasonable name for a large beetle that feeds on trees and roots. It is found in much of Central and South America, and outsized males can reach 15 centimetres in body length. This is a truly spectacular thing. I thought its smooth, hard wing cases look amazing. The strong mandibles of the male may be used for fighting with rivals, and the related titan beetle which readily grows a good bit larger than the Imperious Sawyer, can bite a pencil in two with its mandibles. Longhorn beetles like these, there are 35,000 species of longhorn in total, have excellent olfactory capabilities, presumably helped by their, the huge antennae that, that give them their name, and so can smell the exudates produced by ill and stressed trees, which are exactly the kind of trees that their larvae can readily attack. Once a few beetle larvae are busy burrowing into such a tree, it presumably becomes more stressed, and so is presumably then easier to find. The remarkable Macrodontia cervicornis, uh, the scientific name means long-toothed deer antler, is another longhorn beetle, and is close to the longest beetle on Earth, if one includes the huge jaws. It is also from the tropical Americas, where females lay eggs in dead or dying trees. Some scientists believe the larval stage to last as long as 10 years, and the galleries left in the wood, consumed by the burrowing larvae, can be over a metre long and 10 centimetres wide. I couldn't find out what the male's long mandibles are for, but either throwing or biting a rival seems a reasonable guess. It's interesting that both sexes have the same beautiful wing markings. Next is the Hercules beetle, another contender for longest beetle and famous for its remarkable horn used for grabbing and throwing rival males. Strictly speaking, they have a thoracic horn, the long one, and a cephalic horn which hinges from the front of the head. And these are moved with respect to each other in order to be able to grab a rival. And the underside is covered in bright orange hairs. I was unable to find out what these role these hairs have, although olfaction would be my guess. 
Fights between males are over territories rather than directly over females, and they continue, tend to continue until a male is injured, retreats, or is left upside down and therefore helpless. As with all the species on this video so far, this is another, spe this is another species of the tropical Americas, whose larvae feed on rotten wood. It is thus a valuable decomposer in the local ecosystem. Larvae of the Hercules beetle take approximately two years to mature. The size of the horn in the adult male varies greatly as a result of genetic, genetic predisposition in relation to nutrition, stress, exposure to parasites and or physiological conditions. The penultimate beetle in this video is the wonderful black rhino beetle. Also huge and impressive, its fighting horns are much shorter than the Hercules beetle, but are still wonderful to behold. It is named after a Theban hero of ancient Greece, Actaeon, and this is a South American species whose larval stage t takes three years to mature. A larva has been found that reached half a pound in weight. This is thus the world record holder for a living insect. In some beetle species where males fight with each other over territory, the howler monkey dung beetle of Central America is especially well studied, there are two behavioural strategies, large aggressive guard males who fight for mates, and smaller sneaks who have large testes rather than large horns to make the most of sneak matings. Whenever a male chooses a guard or a sneak morphology and associated behaviour, this happens at the larval stage and will depend on the resource availability during that period. This can thus inform them of the likely physical status of their local rivals when they all mature to adulthood months into the future. This physiological decision, because it is not really a decision, is all entirely instinctive of course and is mediated by hormonal control. But the idea that the male will thus make the most adaptive decision bearing in mind his own physiological health compared to the likely physiological strength of his rivals. As you can see, we've now moved on to the last beetle, the elephant beetle. It doesn't look a million miles from a tan-coloured version of its jet black relative that we've just seen. This also has a long larval stage, in this case about 29 months, where it feeds on wood, yielding a huge maggot-like larva that pupates into an adult over a period of about five weeks. The adults live between one and three months. The male's horns are, as usual, used for defence and for attacking rival males. It's been a real pleasure sharing these remarkable insects with you. I always try to include some photography trips in these videos as well as the imagery. So here the standard shots using my hands for scale were shot from above using a 24 to 70 lens at the 70 mil end and the macro shots both stills and video using a 200 millimeter Nikkor macro although a much less exotic macro lens would have done the job fine. Ambient light was used throughout in on a fairly drab day using light coming through the skylights and a very solid tripod and ball head was essential because the exposures were long and the pull focus videos needed the camera to be totally motionless as I adjusted the focus. Many thanks for watching and we should be back with British Wildlife next time.